Good evening, all, and welcome to our Let's Talk About It series. It's such a joy to have you with us again. Thank you for taking your time to be here. We really appreciate you. I'm Remy Kayode, and I am the education lead for NSF UK. Tonight, I'm one of your two moderators. The other moderator is Tola Ayeni, a member of NSF UK. I'd like to quickly say that, um, just to remind those of us that are here for the first time, that NSF UK stands for Nigerian Schools Foundation, and it's the umbrella body for Nigerian All Students Alumni. It's a collaboration of UK-based alumni association with the mission of connecting people, promoting awareness, and developing communities. Tonight's webinar will be focusing on the issue of insurance, demystifying the myths. Our speakers will be addressing some of the key issues around this topic. So as we go through the session tonight, please feel free to put your questions into the chat box. The questions will be collated later and our speakers will um, answer those questions. And as usual, please be reminded that this webinar is being recorded and is live streamed onto YouTube. Our first speaker tonight is Ebenezer Wenu Hundei of EYH Insurance Consultants. Ebenezer is a fellow of the Chattered, Institute, Chattered Insurance Institute and a practicing insurance broker. He graduated from Kharkov Agricultural University, Ukraine, formerly USSR, with a master's degree in agricultural chemistry and soil science in 1985. He joined the Lagos State Graduate Farmer Scheme in 1986, and during the period, he was also a part-time agent for Niger Insurance PLC in Lagos, Nigeria. He relocated to UK and obtained his associateship in 1991 and the fellowship of the Chartered Insurance Institute in 1994. He has been a postal tutor for the Chartered Insurance Institute since 1994, helping new members of the Institute to obtain their professional qualifications in insurance. He joined the high street chain, Key West Insurance Brokers in 1990 as an insurance technician and became a branch manager in 1993. Ebenezer started his broking firm, EYH Insurance Consultants in 1995. The firm is authorized and regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority, FCA, to advise and arrange general and assist people with their insurance related problems. Please welcome Ebenezer. Thank you, Dr. Remy Kayode. And a big thank you to the NSF UK for such a rare and wonderful opportunity to present before this noble audience today. Slide. Insurance. Demystifying the needs. So was today are very very much aware of these two phrases. And that's even if you yourself have not said it before regarding insurance companies. Insurers, they are legalized robbers. Insurers, I don't trust them. All they do is to collect our monies and when it's time to pay claims, the story starts. Depends on what side insurance presents to you, you might be tempted to align yourself with the minority that have been qualifying insurance people that way. But before you do, I would like to share with you these two real life experiences and hopefully that will help you to be able to have an informed opinion about insurance 
and the players in it. 30 years ago, in 1990 to be precise, in my early years of insurance, I arranged a comprehensive private motor policy for a young man on a brand new car. He was very happy. And a few months down the line, the young man came back to the office to report an accident. And unfortunately, on this particular occasion, he was not driving the car we insured him to drive. And the young man thought having a comprehensive motor policy covers everything, including any car whatsoever. And it was wrong. And you will agree with me on this occasion that the young man too may be inclined to qualify the industry as legalized robots. Moving on 30 years, we are all in a current state of the COVID-19 global pandemic. Some of the commercial clients have had their claims paid following the, this unfortunate incident. Some are yet to be plain, uh, to be compensated to the point that this particular side of a claim has been, is going through the law courts. Now, those that have not been compensated from their own side too, may be inclined to qualify the industry as legalized robbers. Now we have a private client and we have commercial clients, both of them having almost the same opinion. This is what we call expectation gap. That is a gap between what you thought you had cover for and what exactly the cover that you have. It's really a big issue in the industry. We are constantly working on it, but you will agree with me that it is something that has to be worked on alongside with our clients. But for you as clients to be able to understand what you need to do, you need to understand the insurance model, which is why I've decided to break down the insurance elementary basics so that we can all understand it, understand why insurance companies behave the way they behave. And at some point we we'll all meet at a particular point and move together mutually. Insurance is a business of insuring risk. And what is risk? The element, the risk is elementary definition is anything that threatens your existence. It could be a risk of tripping over, a risk of having an accident, risk of falling down in the bathroom, for example. Those, we refer them as pure risk. Or it could be a fundamental risk. That fundamental risk are risk that affects a whole community. They affect a town, they affect a country, and in, in some instances, they affect a, the, the whole world, like we are all going through at the moment. Now, these fundamental risks, they rarely occur, but when they do, they come with high severity. That is why most insurance companies tread carefully when they write in fundamental risk. We, as individuals, are at a point when we feel we need to transfer this risk to somebody else. That is when insurance comes in, which is a risk transfer mechanism where you transfer your risk to somebody else, on this occasion an insurer, who is willing to accept it for a consideration. And that consideration is what we call premium. And that premium that you pay must reflect the complexity of the risk you are bringing in. And every single penny of the premium collected goes into what we call a common pool. And that common pool 
is where all the claims are being paid from. And the regulators use this common pool along with other criteria to determine the capacity of an insurer and the type and nature of the risk they can take on, whether we like it or not. Insurance plays a vital role in our society. As I said earlier, you would like to transfer this risk to somebody else. The insurers are willing to accept that. You have, have that peace of mind that they have taken that risk off your shoulder. You continue on and get on with your life and do what you love to do best. The industry is the second largest invisible earner for the country after the banking industry. Insurance industry exports risk, exports insurance services globally, particularly in the area where the lawyers of London operate. I'll come to that in a minute. And whether you accept it or not, insurance industry plays a vital role in combating crime in the society. The insurance market is huge. And surprisingly enough, the largest player in that market are the insurance members of the public. You are the largest player. Simply put it, that there is no insurance. If you are not willing to, if you want to manage your risk yourself, then there is nothing for the industry to do. Followed by the lawyers of London, this is the only market, the only area where insurance is traded face to face. Like, ordinary, like in the marketplace. And this is where complex, unusual risks are being placed. Where you have the pianist coming to insure his fingers, the ballerina dancer coming to insure her legs, her toes, and then the footballer coming to insure his legs. The mainstream insurance products are being placed with insurance companies. And for those of us who are experienced buyers, you probably wouldn't need anybody. You just go straight to the insurance companies. But for many of us, we use the services, engage the services of insurance intermediaries who can use their knowledge and expertise of the market to help you choose a suitable product. They come as tied agents, multi-tied and independent agents. Along with those interplayers, we have the insurance of yours. We have the actuarial scientists, the loss, adjust, uh, loss adjusters, and the loss assessors. Of particular interest to you will be loss assessors in the unlikely event of a huge claim like fire. You need the services of these people to help you adjust and negotiate complex claims. Every single insurance policy that is written is underpinned by these six major principles. The indemnity principle. You cannot make a profit from insurance policy. This policy enables the underwriters to put you back in the position you were before the insured event occurred. The principle of contribution. I tell you what, there is no point in any one of us trying to arrange two insurances or three on a particular item because these two, three companies will come together when it comes to claim and all of them will contribute in accordance with their own terms and condition of the policy is that, that they've written. So that simply means a loss of premium for you. You don't need to go that route. The insurable interest, you cannot insure any property where you do not have financial interest. When it comes to issues of life insurance, for example, parents do not have insurable interest on their, in the life of their children. The only exception to that will be spouses, where they have unlimited insurable interest in each other's lives and in each other's properties. The principle of subrogation only comes in when there's a claim. When you notify your insurer of a claim and it is not your fault, they will deal with this claim in accordance with the terms of the agreement you have with them, but they will step in your shoes to negotiate for a refund on, from the other negligent party. Whether they succeed in getting it or not, 
is irrelevant to you, you will still get your claims fully sorted. The principle of proximate cause, every insured event that the underwriters are going to pay for, they need to know what has actually happened, what has caused it. You will agree with me that there is a massive difference between a claim arising out of fire through arson, which is leaning more towards crime, and a claim arising out of electrical faults in the house. And the last of all the six principles is the ultimate good faith. That puts a heavy burden on you as a policyholder. You must disclose all material facts to the insurance company because they need that information to be able to decide whether they want to take on that risk. And if they are going to take the risk on, they want to be able to determine how much to charge you. There are two types of insurance, the general insurance and the life insurance. My co-presenter this evening will be dealing with the life insurance side, but for the general, I can tell you that we have two major types. The personal lines, which are the ones that deals with us as individuals, and examples of those are motor, household, personal accident, health insurance, or the commercial lines, which deals with the commercial businesses. We have packages for shops, restaurants, and you have aviation, insurance, marine, professional indemnity, liability, to, to mention a few. Of all these insurances, there are only two compulsory insurances. The first one being the employer's liability and the second one being motto insurance. Even the motto, we only have the Road Traffic Act liability that is compulsory. And that simply means, should you in, be involved in an unfortunate accident in causing damage to a third party, your insurer will pay up to 250,000 pounds for property damage and unlimited cover you have for death and injury. The act that governs the activities of motor insurance provides an alternative for car insurance. Just in, in case you like to consider that, all you need to do is deposit 500,000 with the high cost of the land like we have the, the, the Supreme Court, the High Court, or the Crown Court. They will issue with a, a certificate or a, a guarantee that when you use your vehicle on the road, if any incident happens, they will use part of the 500,000 to, to settle the claim for you. But before you consider that route, I'd like you to think about this particular accident that happened on the 28th of February, 2001, is the Selby Rail crash just one car accident involving two trains resulted in 10 deaths and 82 injured. And the total cost to the insurer at that time was 22 million. So 22 million pounds, if you take off your 500,000 pounds, there's a shortfall of 21.5 million. Where are you getting that from? We are more or less looking towards bankruptcy there now. And of course there are exceptions to the to car insurance the following vehicles, are, are, the following authorities are exempt, the Crown vehicles, county councils, the police authorities and the health authorities. The reason behind that is the government has the ability to meet up with the liabilities incurred by these authorities. Looking at the audience, I took a decision to come up with two products for us tonight motor insurance and household insurance. The motor insurance is a, a well commoditized product now. More the internet to arrange it. You don't bother to use the service of an agent anymore, but in as much as the insurance companies are taking advantage of the technology available to them, you need to understand that the underwriting behind this policy has not shifted you have to understand why they ask certain questions. One, if you try to answer a simple question, how long have you lived in the UK? Two, three years, very few companies will quote for you. But generally we have these five 
criteria they use, vehicle, the policy order, the cover you want, the area you live, and the use of the car. Household, they only use two criteria they for the area you live and the sum in short. And for those of us that do rent out this, they use the trip into account the type of tenants you put in the property. For just a few hundred pounds, you can cover your house against the risk of fire, lightning explosions. And for those who want to add more, you can include accidental damage. And of course, that gives you peace of mind. And they provide you with alternative accommodation in the unlikely event of you needing to vacate your house following an insured event. Once you have arranged your policy with the insurance companies or the brokers, we are duty bound to supply you with certain documents. You need to get those documents, go through those documents, immediately you get them. And also with your renewals. When you get your renewals, please know that the insurance companies are not duty bound to invite renewals. All they do is because they spend huge amount of money on marketing. And if all it takes them is to send out renewal notices and save a lot of money, they send it. When you get it, you are not duty bound to accept the renewals. You can shop around. And we always include what you paid last year, which is an alert for you to know that you have to shop around. If you do decide to go ahead with them, please note that this is the time for you to disclose any material changes during the year. Insurance claims. This is the shop window for all insurance companies. I hear it often and often that insurance don't pay claims. I'll tell you what, they love to pay claims because that is an opportunity for them to demonstrate their, their claims service is what their reputation really depends on. And they need those statistics in order for them to be able to market themselves properly for new businesses and retain their existing clients. So in the unlikely event of you needing to make a claim, I'll probably say don't panic, relax. I have never seen any single condition on a policy that says you must report it immediately. All you have is report as soon as possible, or maybe at most within 72 hours. Go back to your underwriting file and make sure that when you call them, you are not going to give any information that is fundamentally different from what they already have. And I can assure you that your claim will go smoothly. COVID-19 and insurance, as we all know, we're all going through So as we deliver this today, we are being, COVID has affected the whole world. Insurance is not an exception. But as the government is trying their best the insurance industry is doing everything possible they can do to assist their policyholders. Motor insurance, they've given most of us rebates during the lockdown period because they know we're not using our vehicles. For the commercial premises that have been unoccupied, they have extended the unoccupancy period for them. And for our home insurance, those of us that are using it to do business, you don't need to call them when you do business from home now because they understand what we're all going through. And the travel insurance, they did their very best to help people that were locked down, that they were stranded in various parts of the world until the UK government was able to repatriate them back to UK. The business interruption case is the highlight of it for us. Like I said earlier, most companies have paid. A few companies are yet to, be, to pay out their clients and the case have, they've had the final hearing on the 16th or 19th of November. Come January or December this year, we'll get to know the final outcome of that particular COVID-19 business interruption case. The industry is heavily regulated. The lawyers have their own unique regulation, but for us, the insurance companies, uh, the companies and the brokers, we have the Prudential Regulation Authority and the FCA regulating activities, and you are the center of it all. Treating customers fairly is at the center of all this regulation. We must be transparent in everything we do for, with you. And your money that you pay any of us is protected from the time you part with it until it gets to the common pool where it will be used to pay claims. 
and the insurance ombudsman is there to assist you should you have any complaints about any com any member of the insurance industry their decision is binding on the insurance companies not binding on you you can still take your case for that to the law court if you want to in closing i have made up a checklist for us here when you have a claim you please need to understand that the insurance are there to pay your claim that's when they are in business and you are entitled to your indemnity all you need to do is ask for your indemnity in the right manner go through your statement of facts that's the proposal form or the survey report that was done at the time because you have to remember that a successful claim is paid from the time the policy was written because one once the paperwork is fine from the beginning, there's no reason for them to turn it down when a claim occurs. Check your statement of facts, check your excesses, policy conditions, warranties, make sure you've complied with them. And all those six principles I mentioned earlier, make sure that you have not faulted on any of those six principles and you will be surprised that at the end of it all, the insurance companies and in a symbiotic way we need each other and it will be a case of golden handshake business as usual i have here for you my contact details just in case after this event you like to contact me but you have to understand that when you have an insurance problem you it's always good to seek an opinion you don't need to be my client for you to contact me for any second opinion. I'll be happy to do that. And most of my industry colleagues, there are about 20,000 of us out there, and we are there simply because of you to help you out with any insurance related matters. And also, I just in case you'd like to know more about what is going on in the industry, I've got some references here for you. The Financial Conduct Authority website, they have in there the daily update on coronavirus for you and the Association of British Insurers, where all the insurance companies that operate in the UK are part, you can always go through it. And for us, the insurance brokers, the British Insurance Brokers Association. And then if you want to know more about the financial ombudsman, I've got all this for you. I urge you to please spend some time, go through them. And I'm sure at the end of it all, you will realize that the insurance industry, they are there as your friend, to give you peace of mind and you'll be able to continue with your daily activities when there's somebody dealing with all those risky issues for you. I thank the NSF for this wonderful opportunity given to me tonight. And in particular, I want to try and thank the audience for sparing your time, devoting your time for this particular evening presentation. I would like to hand over back to the moderator now and I'll be staying back for the question and answers afterwards. Thank you so much. Bye for now. Thank you so much for that informative um, presentation. I'm sure that our audience have been listening attentively. I'm sure some of them will have questions, which like you rightly said, will be passed on to you um, in the course of this evening. We now move on to our second speaker, who is Debbie. Debbie is a practicing member of the Chartered Insurance Institute and the Society of Will Writers. She attended FGGC BIDA, Federal Government Girls College BIDA in Niger State in Nigeria. She graduated with a degree in computer science from Olabisi Onobanjo University. She also has an MBA in finance and she started her banking career in 1998 and worked for three major banks in Nigeria, one of which was Zenith Bank. She was a deputy manager in Zenith Bank as at 2011 when she then left for UK. She joined MetLife as a sales advisor in 2012 and joined You Insure in 2014 where she is currently a specialist protection manager. In 2018, Debbie joined the Society of Will Writers, where she trained as a will writer. She is the principal consultant 
CEO of ECAG Financial Solutions. Debbie enjoys helping people with their protection plans. So tonight, it's a privilege to have Debbie with us. And can we please welcome Debbie? Good evening, everyone. I want to say a big thank you to the organizers of this event, the NSF. I also want to say a big thank you to the audience. I consider it a privilege for you to have given me your time this evening to speak with you. The purpose of this meeting is to share some information so that we would educate our audience more on insurance. The earlier speaker said insurance alliance, and we're here today to demystify all those myths about insurance. I am going to be talking mostly on personal insurance. Personally, I prefer to use the term protection. What is protection? Protection is any measure taken to guard a thing against damage caused by outside forces. Insurance is a means of protection from financial loss. It is a form of risk management primarily used to hedge against the risk of a contingent or uncertain loss. There are four key areas in life that needs protection. Family, mortgage, business, and estate planning. Why might you need insurance? In life, certain unexpected events occur that we have little or no control over, and such events tend to be life-changing. And the question is, how do we cope when such happens? How can you be protected? And in what areas? Do you own a home? The, the house actually belongs to the lender until you finish paying off the mortgage. Insurance can help you pay that huge debt should anything happen to your income or you die. Do you run a business? Insurance helps you to manage risks of ownership, employee, employment retirement plans, and group benefits and the like. Insurance helps you to protect, to provide for your family. In the event of death, there are insurance options for short and long-term needs that protect your family's lifestyle and the cost of post-secondary education for children. Insurance helps you to maintain your current lifestyle and to cover healthcare costs. Now I'm gonna be talking about the different types of life insurance products that are available. We have the income protection, previously called permanent health insurance. We have the critical illness protection and life insurance. What is income protection? Income protection pays a portion of your income each month if you're unable to work due to illness or injury. And this allows you to focus on recovery. Your outgoings don't stop once your income stops. Income protection can give you that peace of mind that you can afford to pay your bills and not rely on your personal savings or statistic pay. What is critical illness protection? Critical illness protection is designed primarily to support you and your family while you deal with your diagnosis of life-changing conditions and treatment so you can focus on recovery. It pays out a lump sum if you suffer any of the listed conditions, e.g. cancer, stroke, heart attack, coronary artery bypass, surgery, kidney failure, major organ transplant, and the like. But note that the definition of each illness differs from one insurer to the other. Life insurance, what is life insurance? A life insurance policy provides a tax-free money to your loved ones when you die. It can help cover final arrangements or pay off a mortgage or other expenses. Life insurance is there to make sure that when you die, your family can have a financial safety net to fall back on. Do you want to leave your family with a huge debt or a roof over their heads? Moving on, I'm gonna talk a bit about the underwriting process. What is underwriting process? Underwriting process is the process whereby insurance companies charge rates proportionate to the risk of insuring specific 
individuals. As part of this process, the insurance company may ask certain questions or require you to undergo medical tests or exams. After this underwriting process has been done, then you are offered five possible outcomes. When you apply for an insurance policy, you may be accepted on standard terms, that is accepted exactly as you were quoted, or the, the conditions, the, the terms may be reversed. Either your premiums are in, increased or your sum assured are reduced, maybe because of an existing medical condition. Another outcome could be, it could be deferred. You may be asked to wait, come back six months time. This usually could be maybe because you're waiting for the outcomes of some medical tests and, or you're waiting to undergo a surgery. And the last outcome could be an outright decline. Now, I wanna talk about another type of protection. I believe when you say you're protected, you should have a full bouquet of products and not walking around with half an umbrella. So the other protection plans to consider, one is a trust. What is a trust? A trust is a legal vehicle or a relationship that allows a third party or a trustee to hold and direct assets in a trust fund on behalf of a beneficiary. These assets may be property, income, or as or shares. A trust greatly expands your options when it comes to managing your assets, whether you're trying to shield your wealth from taxes or pass it on to your children. There are various types of trusts, but time will not permit me to share all of them here, to explain all the types of trusts here. The next thing I'm gonna talk about is wills. What is a will? A will, also called a testament, testamentary will, is a legally enforceable document that states how you want your affairs handled and your assets distributed after you die. It is an important component of estate planning. If you die without a will, it means you die interstate and interstate rules will apply. In simple terms, you, it simply means you allow the government to write one for you. I may not be exactly as you will have wished. If you have young children, then you need to consider guardianship. It is important to have a will that appoints guardians for your young children. If a guardian is not appointed at the time of death, your surviving family will have to seek help in a probate court to have guardians appointed for your children. It is only a mother that has an automatic parental responsibility. Fathers do not have this automatically. The person appointed by the court to be a guardian to your children may not be whom you will have wanted or even who the children will have wanted to live with. And um, back home, you've seen how children and even sometimes the wives are passed on to relatives and some really do suffer as a result of this. Here in this, in this country, the social services take over. Whilst it is important to deal with your estate on death, because we're all gonna die one day, it's just we don't know when, how, or where. But it's important to ensure that you have provisions in place should anything happen to you during your lifetime. One way to do this is by the use of lasting powers of attorney. What is a lasting power of attorney? A lasting power of attorney is a little document that allows you to plan ahead by choosing one or more persons you trust or a professional such as a, such as a trust corporation to step in your shoes and make decisions and take appropriate actions on your behalf regarding your affairs, either your health and your welfare affairs or your property and your financial affairs should you lose mental capacity. Moving on, I'm, going to, I'm sharing this slide that shows us the rules of interstitial flowchart. People erroneously believe that, oh, if I die, my other uh, surviving spouse will get everything that I own, but that's not the case. If you have a spouse and you die without a will, the first 270,000 worth of your asset 
goes automatically to your surviving spouse. And then the rest is still shared according to the intestacy rule. But this might not be exactly what you want, especially when you are coming from previous marriages or you are cohabiting and such things like that. Now, when considering some common excuses why people consider, why people don't consider insurance. I've heard people say in my, in my years on this board, they will say, no, I don't have any money, I can't afford it. But the truth is, if you sit down with a financial advisor and you go through your finances, you can find that easily that you can afford insurance by just making some few adjustments to your budget. Example, stopping that cup of coffee you have from Costa every day. Some say, I don't need it, God is my insurer. Some say, no hurry, I'll do it later. This year, 2020, more than anything has shown all of us that anything can happen to anybody at any point in time, even the whole world, anything can happen to the whole world. I'm sure this year we all know one person or the other who has been affected, has died, their business has packed up or whatever because of COVID-19. COVID Some will tell you, no, I don't trust insurance. They only collect money. When it's, when it's time for them to pay back, they start giving you excuses. My co-presenter, I'm sure, has now debunked all those ideas that we have in our mind about insurers being of legalized robbers. Some will say I have it already, or my provider provides it, my employer provides it for me. My question will be, find out from your employer, is it transferable when you leave that employment? Or if you have it already, when last did you review it? Things happen and insurance regularly improve on their products. So it's always a good idea to review your plans, your policies, whichever one you have. And some will say, I will search online, it is cheaper. Yes, it might be cheaper. But my question to you is, do you exactly understand those boxes you're ticking? Because when it's now time to make a claim and because you have ticked something wrongly, you do not get paid. You now say insurers are legalized robbers. Moving on, I want us to ponder on these questions. How would your family cope financially if one of you fell ill, lost a job, or died? Would you like to protect your life cover from corporate delay? And from avoiding and from paying too much tax? What would happen to underage children if one parent died or the couple weren't married? Think about these questions. I'm sure you know somebody that didn't answer these questions when it was necessary. When considering the type of protection you need, it is important to consider how these types of covers can work together to, to help protect you and your loved ones, whether it is due to you being unable to work, developing a critical illness, losing capacity, or passing away. Given a choice, which one would you protect? The goose or the golden egg? I'm sure that with all that we've heard this evening, we are now wiser and we're now more informed. We would choose to protect the breadwinner, the goose. It wasn't raining when the ark was built. Don't wait until you need insurance before you take it because then you may not be able to get it or it will be too expensive. Act now and book a free consultation. I've also included um, links to some videos I would encourage everyone to watch, particularly the seven families and then the de deadline to breadline. My question is, how wealthy are you? Your wealth is actually defined by how long you can maintain your current lifestyle if for any reason your income stops. So please, I encourage us all to take the time and watch these videos. Here are my contact details. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. I'm available even after this program. 
for questions and please feel free to contact me. Once again, I thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your presence here today. And I hand over back to the presenters. Thank you. Thank you very much, Debbie Liadi, for that um, excellent presentation. Thank you to yourself and um, Ebenezer for debunking the myths surrounding insurance. And I guess that um, we already have some questions from our participants. So I would like to invite my co-moderator Tola Ayeni to take over the session. Over to you, Tola. Okay. Thank you, Debbie, and thank you, Ebenezer, for your wonderful presentation today. Um, as um, Remy, Dr. Remy Karade has said to you, we have questions from the uh, audience. And uh, the first question that I'm going to ask today will be questions directed to Debbie. Okay. So Debbie, my question, my first question to you um, is, What's the difference between, what is the difference between um, a critical illness cover and an income protection cover? What's the difference between uh, a critical illness cover and an income protection cover? And do I actually need both? The audience would like to know. Thank you very much for your question. Yes, you need both. And I'll tell you why. A critical illness protection cover pays out a lump sum once you are diagnosed with any of the illnesses defined by your provider. With this lump sum, you can adjust um, your life. Um, you can make changes to the home. Let's say, for instance, you need to install a, a stair lift in your house. You need to move a bedroom downstairs. You need to create a wet room. Or you want to go on that holiday you had always dreamed of especially in cases where they say it's probably terminal, you will get that lump sum and you can plan and make some things done for yourself with that lump sum. But an income protection plan, in quote, replaces your salary between 65 to 80%, depending on the provider, and then how, how much and how long you get paid depends on your own occupation. So income protection pays you monthly, whereas critical illness pays out on diagnosis of a critical illness. With income protection, anything that stops you from working, from stop doing your own occupation, it could even be mental health issues, it could be a bad back, it could be any injury, but a critical illness is those critical illnesses, cancer and those other big ones. I hope my answer was very clear. Thank you very much. Thank and you. I have another question for you from the audience. They're asking, they'd like to know what's the difference between a will and a trust. They want to know the difference between a will and a trust. And they'd also like to know if they would need both. Thank you very much. Um, like I explained in my presentation, a will is a document that states how you want your estates distributed and, to, and who gets what. It merely tells a judge who you want to receive your assets. But the main thing, difference between that and a trust is a will will go through a probate. Probate simply means the process where the court supervises the distribution of the assets of a dissident. When somebody passes away, the trust, the, the executors will now gather together, uh, try and gather together everything that the person owns put a value to it and do that and do that, all being supervised by the court. Whereas a trust, immediately the uh, person dies and the insurer is notified that this person is gone, the right money gets into the right hand in the right time. There is no probate. So that money can just go straight and the family has the money to start planning what they need to do. A will is not private. It's um, um, registered in the court. Anybody can go and look at the contents of that will. But a trust is very private. Only people authorized have access to it. Secondly, and thirdly, a will at the onset is cheaper to uh, put in place, to write. 
But by the time you're putting together all the person's assets, going to court to get the probate and do this, it, it's, it's time consuming, it's emotional, and so many other things attached to it. Whereas a trust may be import, may be costly at the onset, or you save yourself more hassles by just creating a trust. And then okay. the difference is that a will comes into place when the testator has died. But some with the, with the advancement of technology, people live longer now. So you might actually live long, but you are, you are not able to make decisions for yourself. And with a trust, even when you are alive and you have lost the mental capacity, either due to accident or illness, um, dementia or any of those things, you have put people in trust uh, in place that can take decisions for you. For instance, somebody might say, I do not want to be placed on the life support machine. You can use those kind of things to put it in place. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, Debbie. Very clear and very detailed. Thank you for your response. Uh, the next set of questions I have is for Beniza. Um, Debbie, I might come back to you for one more question, okay? okay. I'm just looking at the chat and trying to relay the questions to you. Okay, Abinisa, you've got these questions here. Um, the first question here says, um, you said motto insurance is compulsory and that the other day your auntie was involved in an accident which was not her fault and the other driver was not insured. Um, how is that possible that people are driving on the road when the insurance is compulsory and how can she get compensated for her losses? That's the first question. Please, could you go for it briefly? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll be very brief on that, but it's such a very rare incident now because the police, police are very strict in enforcing the, the um, motor insurance on the road. And in addition to that, the DVLA too, which is the Divisional License Authority, they enforce it as well. But whatever has happened to your auntie has happened. All she needs to do is get in touch with a solicitor that specializes in Road Traffic Act and personal injury claim. All they will do is the negligent driver will be taken to court and they will get a judgment against him. And once the judgment has been granted, they'll give him seven days to pay, which in most cases they don't pay. And then your mm -hmm. solicitor will now take that judgment after seven days to an organization we call Motto Insurance Bureau, and they will settle the claim. And you ask me, where is the Motto Insurance Bureau getting the money from? All the insurance companies in the UK that write motor business, they are members of the MIB and they pay a levy every year, which is proportionate to the volume of business they're writing. And the money is just there sitting there waiting for incidents like this to happen, like the uh, uninsured drivers, or in rare cases, untraced motorists. Okay. And of course, the MIB would. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your useful response you. to that question. There's a very, very interesting question here, which I'm sure you would like to deal with. It says, um, how does insurance help to combat fraud in the society? How does insurance help to combat fraud in the society? Could you go for that, please, briefly. Okay, I, I, I would just like to explain that by quickly citing two examples. Okay, the crash for cash program, which was, it was a fraud program about five years ago on our streets where innocent drivers are driving. And all of a sudden you will see somebody driving an old banger, they will old car, they will just overtake you and stop abruptly in front of you, leaving you with no option but to hit them. And there we are, we have five or five people in their own car. So five people claiming for personal injuries. And because the common law rule says you must maintain a breaking distance. And as a result of that, your insurance company will pay. Your premium will go up. But the insurance company started noticing a pattern, old banger, five people, all of them claiming for injuries and they started their yes. investigation. And eventually they got some of these people, they passed the case on to the police and the police with the Crown Prosecution Service, they did the NAFO and they ended up behind bars. Same thing with the issue of, for example, I insured a, a restaurant and there was fire there and we thought it was a genuine fire, not realizing it was arson. And of course, at the end of the day, following the investigation, we realized that this was an arson and the two brothers ended up behind bar. 
So insurance, mm -hmm. of course, they try their very best to do what they have to do to their loyal clients by yes. winning out some of these um, to minimize situations yeah. like that. Thank you very, very much. Okay. Now, uh, the last question, and I'll see if I have any uh, opportunity to ask Debbie one more. If not, we would have to just move on. You explained uh, that the Road Traffic Act, that's RTA, yeah. cover, um, th that that cover is compulsory. Now, what is the difference between the RTA and the TPO, the third party only? Uh, that's like the third uh, party fire and theft and the okay. comprehensive. What's the difference between those two? Yeah, the road traffic act cover, which is the compulsory element of road traffic and the motor insurance, only covers you for third party liability up to 250,000 pounds for property damage and unlimited cover for injury and all debt. Now, if you choose to go third party fire and theft, that 250,000 pounds has been increased now to unlimited on property damage. And then the third party fire and theft will now include the risk of fire and theft on your vehicle, whilst the comprehensive, in addition to all those, will include any accidental damage to your car, regardless of fault, whether it's your fault or not, they will deal with the third party, deal with your car. So those are the main differences between all those, all those policies. So cover. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you very, very much for um, you know, your answers. Uh, thank you very much for taking out the time to be here. Um, I'd like to just very, very quickly, you know, summarize your key points. You know, our insurance companies, nothing but robbers in suits, as we've heard today, no. They provide for peace of mind for policyholders. And um, for a small premium, you can cover the risk of your valuable uh, possessions, your car, your house, your feet, if you like, you know, if you're a footballer, your hands, if you're a pianist. Are they trick stars? Certainly not. They're simply misunderstood. So remember, just as Debbie said, that it wasn't raining when Noah built an ark. You need to protect the goose. I'd like to say thank you once again to Debbie and Ebenezer, and thank you to everyone for attending today's uh, web webinar titled um, Insurance Demystifying the Myths. I'm sure that a lot of myths today have been demystified. And if you have any other questions, please email webinar at nsf.community. Just before you leave today, uh, today's webinar, you will actually see that there's an exit survey on your screen. And we would appreciate if you would complete it and you know, provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to uh, viewing a recording of today's webinar. Please note that this is our last webinar in this series for 2020. On behalf of NSF UK, and our presenters, thank you for joining us today and have a very, very good evening. Good night.